about the eggs. Some of you heard me joke about that. Clearly, it was not. What we want to do this morning is we have a very special speaker, and I'm sure that is why you're all actually achieving educational awards for the spring. Yeah. And, right? And why you got up at the party. Clearly, LaShonda did. <laughs> So we want to welcome you this morning, congratulate you for your significant achievement, but most importantly, we want to introduce the most important speaker that we have brought to our district ever. And I want to just recognize Valerie, who's over there serving breakfast, for her significant achievement in obtaining Trisha Ron. We're going to finish it So let's give Valerie a hand up. Major, any type of electronic Game Boy, any type of strange device that you may have, make some noise, help with the blood muscle, just mute those, just turn them straight off. You're not going to want to get a vibration in the middle of Patricia's speech unless it's a proper speech. So it could take somebody left. So now let's talk a little bit about Patricia and why this is so special for you. For those of you who heard Craig Valentine in the fall, and let's see how many of you there in the fall and heard Craig speak. All right, let's prove why you achieved the educational award. As we know, Craig said he was, even though he the world, won the world championship, he was not the speaker that he thought he should be. And in fact, he needed to find a mentor and coach to help him become the speaker that we were, which was an excellent speaker. And he said he had to find one coach one coach only who could have helped him become the speaker he was. And he paid how much money? Who knows? Four thousand dollars. A second? I gave him a good day. <laughs> and now we're so fortunate to have with us the speaker speaker, the most important speaker we're gonna have this year on the stage, Patricia. Well, the next time you see my friend Craig Valentine, you can tell him, Patricia said she taught you everything you know. She just hasn't taught you everything she knows. <laughs> I certainly won't tell him that you were gracious enough to say I'm the most important speaker because every speaker that you hear I know is important. We're just at different areas of our development. And this breakfast is to honor so many of you for your dedication and commitment to improve your craft. And I congratulate you. And as we are calling this the breakfast of champions, it is very special those who get up early in the morning. And the most favorite story about my grandfather, Bracky Joe, in South Wales, he was a coal miner. And he was also Wales' champion pigeon racer. And my mother used to get up and get him breakfast, because he used to get up way before dawn, and let his pigeons fly in the dark. So whenever there was a race, his pigeons were so accustomed to being in the dark, they always won. And that is a great lesson for us all, because you do not have to be the best, you do not have to be the smartest, you don't actually have to be the fastest, you just have to get up early. <laughs> and do a little more. And that is certainly the pattern of my life. When I grew up in England, I had one brother who was one year, one month, two days, twelve and a half hours younger than I am. And he was one of those kids who was always top of the class, always number one. For me, it was an effort. It was a struggle to be 15th in the class of Thornton. And I thought, well, I'm certainly not as smart as my brother, and I'm probably not as smart as these other kids in the class. I better not miss school. I received 100% 100 attendance certificates for years. Never won anything else, but they always knew I turned up. <laughs> but that is the point. It is better to be consistently dedicated and good than occasionally great. Because it's the ongoing 
consistency that will make you achieve anything you want to achieve. So I commend you for already starting your process. Uh, when I was 12, I decided I'm probably uh, more artistic than academic, so I became a hairstylist at age 15. And in England, when you do an apprenticeship to be a hairstylist, you know, you pass bins and shampoo heads and help and help the stylist, and on a Tuesday evening, we would bring in models. People would pay two shillings and the apprentices would do the head. And all the other girls would do one or two. I would almost do five. And I said to my boss, can I bring models in on a Monday? And he saw I was so interested, he gave me a hair dryer to take home so that I could practice on the neighbor's hair at weekends. So it's just a matter. You don't have to do the best. You, just, you don't have to be the best, you just have to do more. And that really has been the pattern of my life. Now many of you here have said, well, how did you really get started? Isn't there a big difference between a hairstylist and a famous speaker? <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said on 60 Minutes, oh, come on, if you're on 60 Minutes, you'll tell everybody. <laughs> I used to work on the outside of people's heads and I work on the inside. There's only half an inch of difference. <laughs> now everyone wants to know, especially I'm doing well in Toastmasters, what do I have to do, Miss Fripp, to one day be a rich and famous speaker like you and have Craig Valentine talk about me? Well, you keep up the consistency. Because I was lucky enough to have a, my own men's hairstyling salon. I was one of the first women uh, to do men's hairstyling when it was a, a new industry. And when I went to my salon, I was already solidly booked. And one of my mentors said, Frick, you have to go to Dale Carnegie. Now you've been through Dale Carnegie. You have to go to Toastmasters to keep practicing. And who knew when I walked into Cable Car Toastmasters, at 7.15 on a Tuesday morning in the IBM building in San Francisco that one day you would be saying such wonderful, wonderful comments about it. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Well, as I started speaking, and I was traveling nationwide speaking for a hair product company, and all my clients who were the movers and shakers in the San Francisco financial district, which were executives and professionals like you, and then you want to speak, and as you know, every service club is looking for a free speaker next week. <laughs> they, it is so easy to get speaking engagements to practice your craft because everyone is looking for a speaker. And if you have a good presentation, 20 minutes is all you need to get started and maximize each opportunity. So you, they're always visiting Rotarians, or you just go and say, if you like my, my presentation, give my card you program. And that's how we get started. And we also, I train my staff to say to all their clients, if you get 20 of your employees together, Patricia will come give you a free talk. All she, all she asks is, at the end of the speech, let me, she will tell you where the salon is. And I found this was the least expensive way to promote my business. And I had those free engagements. People said, what would you charge to say that to the open of the client students? That was the first person. I said, $50. Next time he asked, it was $5,000. <laughs> it was a few years later. And then someone at the San Mateo Rotary Club said, Patricia, what would you charge to speak on goal setting to uh, school administrators? I said, $50 an hour and travel time. See, I've learned. That's <laughs> something else. And he said, okay, I paid her $125. So having earned outside your hairstyling, what was $175? I went to the National Speakers Association Convention in 19... I went in as a hairstylist and a toastmaster, and someone who was starting to speak and like it, and walked out with a vision of what might be possible long term.
to make money as a speaker is a long-term goal. And I encourage everyone, as I did myself, you speaking to promote what you're doing now. Even if you have a job working for someone else, let your manager or boss know, I would like to be speaking at circus clubs. It's great promo for our business or our company, because when they introduce me, they mention us. Because you might be out a bit late at lunch sometime, get permission, you're part of the PR program. Because it's the ongoing consistency that builds your skills. And then, as you know in Toastmasters, how you get to the next level is feedback. Positive feedback from somebody who is as interested in your success as you are. And has the, the, the skill to give you accurate feedback. Because a question I like to ask all people who are speaking is, are you practicing to improve or to reinforce bad habits? <laughs> and of course you're doing both. We are doing both. Because although we are familiar with the expression practice makes perfect, practice actually makes permanent. <coughs> and therefore you need to be in an environment and also get the skill to be able to look at your own videos and listen to your audios and see what am I doing that works. And do I understand why it works in a way that I can teach somebody else? Then, what might be distracting from your power? And very often that takes someone else to look at it. Or, you, as you improve your eye, you can look at your videos. Now you listen for the sound, then turn it off and look at the movement. And then, for me, I've been good at haircutting and speaking. I didn't start either of those with great talent. I promise you. I started with an interest in, a commitment to, and a personality that suited. Now, there are a lot of incredible, dynamic speakers who are introverts. However, I believe it is easier if you are slightly more extroverted so that you can schmooze and engage with audiences. <laughs> but if you're an introvert, don't use that as an excuse. There are a lot of introverted audiences looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> and non-introverted audiences who can learn from your expertise. Because I promise you, what gets you to the next level is you've got to get started. Have good teachers, coaches, mentors. And then it takes it to a whole new level when you try and teach somebody else. You simplify and demystify what you have spent years learning and help somebody who doesn't have that background. Now, of course, over the years, I have spoken to an incredible variety of audiences. I first got paid to speak in 1976. Went full time in 1984. So, you know, any wrinkle I have earned. <laughs> <laughs> Been a few misplays and sleepless nights in that time. But people always say, you know, what are the groups you remember most? Well, there are so many. I've addressed and coached rocket scientists and nuclear engineers, you know, nuns and about any profession you can think of, including prison wardens. I volunteered in San Quentin Prison. In fact, that was early in my early days, long before I thought I'd be a speaker. Some of my pals from Dale Carnegie were involved in a program called People Builders at San Quentin. And they said, Fred, you want to come and give a speech? And I said, well, what do you talk about? Two inmates. And they said, it doesn't matter what you say. It's that you care enough to go. So I went with my pal. And this group of people, and I was amazed, they were very enthusiastic, because obviously this was a group that chose to be there. The guy was up, <laughs> <laughs> they, they chose to be in the people building. No, no. Clarification. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> I 
said, what did you do? He said, I gave a young lady a ride from, from Dubuque to San Luis Obispo. I said, that doesn't say that. He said, she didn't want to go. <laughs> was in for armed robbery and kidnap, no chance of parole. And I had a hairstyling client, I don't know if you remember if you're old enough from the early human potential movement, we're in a ray and art, and we had something called S seminars, A and <laughs> seminar training, actually Werner's hair. And Werner went in and they had an S training in San Quentin, and Proggy was part of, of the group. And of course the basic message was, is what we know as Toastmasters is you are responsible for your choices and your actions. And Froggy said that was the first time I realized I was really responsible for being here and I stopped trying to escape. Now Froggy was very good at escaping. He told me some air raising story. <laughs> An Est graduate lawyer saw a film that Est made for Froggy in and said, the laws have changed. I think I'm getting parole. I'll handle your case for nothing. And Froggy got, came back. In fact, he, uh, he married a woman who was also an S graduate who started writing to him. And I went to their home and met their little boy and I went to their wedding. And the last time I went back to St. Quentin, I went with Froggy when we were talking to people who were going to be getting out in three weeks. And Froggy said, you know, everyone in St. Quentin doesn't believe they're responsible for being here. They blame their mothers, their fathers, their race, or their environment. But he said, it isn't that much different out here. Everyone's always blaming their government, their boss, the IRS, their mother-in-law. My postmaster meeting is too early to attend. <laughs> However, it's a privilege to talk to people who are committed and taking responsibility for their own growth. So one other story, and this is because how are you going to start? If you want to speak more, and you're probably doing this now, is to speak in the service class. Now this was, this was February of 2000, let's see, no, night, night on. It was February of... 1984. I know that because I retired from hairstyling that summer when I became the president, the first woman president of the National Speakers Association. And at that point, I was so busy between traveling and running my business and, and all my duties as incoming president of the National Speakers Association, I really had no time except for engagement. But you know, you always do a favor for a friend of a friend of a friend. So there I am, driving over and speaking for the Walnut Creek Rotary Club. Now this was a very impressive club. At least 180, 200 people, which you know is big for most Rotary Clubs, and the, we have the mayor, the fire chief, the police chief, all the movers and shakers in Walnut Creek <laughs> Now remember back, this is 84, and the sound systems weren't as good then. They had one of these little rinky dink sound systems with a short little cord made by Mattel. <laughs> <laughs> now if you don't see me, you really don't get your money. <laughs> Just this little thing. So if I made the theatrical choice, I would stand in front of the lecturer and project my voice. As you know. In every country club, there are two retired 92-year-old guys. Now, I'm sure they had very impressive careers. They ran companies. They were very important. But now, they take the same leadership skills and their responsibility to count the money of Rotary. They take very seriously. But at 92, they're a little deaf. <laughs> so I introduced and I start speaking, and these two 90 year old guys over here are talking. Now, they're talking like 
and you know you have the ability to get your speech and talk to yourself. Do <laughs> they know how important I am? Surely they're going to stop talking soon. Well, they didn't stop fast enough for me, so mid-sentence, I stopped speaking. And I said, I don't know if you realise, but I usually get paid quite well to deliver speeches. And when you pay, they treat you so well. <laughs> and then when you do something for nothing, you have to put up with something like people talking through your speech. <laughs> and I'm a very busy woman, and I am happy to leave right now and go back to my business. Oh, I'm happy to continue my speech. But if I do, you are all going to sit down, shut up and listen. <laughs> The mayor, the fire chief, the police chief, snap forward! Leadership in action! <laughs> well, I finished my speech, and I was walking out with my friend, and I said, well, maybe I was a bit too pushy. <laughs> <laughs> September of that year, I am now a full-time speaker, sold my salon, I have no other source of income. Now, of course, I'm from such and such a Rotary Club, and once a year we get together with three other clubs, we take it turns to book the speaker, and we want the best speaker we've ever heard, and that's you. We want to book you for next April. I said, well, I'm very happy to do that, but you understand I'm now full time. April's a very busy month. If you want to call me in March, if I'm not booked, I'm happy to do it. He said, no, 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 we really need you. You're the best speaker we ever heard. We don't want the other clubs to be able to get a speaker as good as you. <laughs> and I said, well, do you know, call me in March. He said, what would it take? I said, well, money. But... <laughs> <laughs> he said, don't you remember who we are? I said, you know, I've spoken at so many rotary clubs. He said, we'll warm that creek you told us off. <laughs> Association thinks your rate's going to pay you fee. Would you believe they sent me a check in September so I turn up next April? So if anyone ever tells you there is no money in Rotary, perhaps you're going to say, Well, I got a friend whispering. <laughs> <laughs> and she. So, with that, ladies and gentlemen, you have fed your bodies, or perhaps you stopped to listen. That was, I'm surprised what attention I've been lucky enough to receive when you have food in front of you. <laughs> but congratulations for your efforts. I hope you will enjoy participating in the rest of the day and enjoy <coughs> the rest of the frick presentations. But at least you can feel very superior when you say, I was part of a small group inviting <laughs> to a personal address for this <laughs>